Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, I want to continue my discussion of function decorators by showing you how to take total control in adding your own custom parameters to your decorators. When you do this, you can get a lot of additional functionality that you otherwise can't get. And it's something that I had to kind of really work at to figure out how I could do this, but I needed it in my work. So join me as I explain all of this riveting information to you. Now, if you're not familiar with function decorators, I did a video on that. I will put a link in the description and go back and watch that riveting video. But what a decorator does is it takes a function as a parameter. So it's a function that takes a function as a parameter. It's a little weird to get your head around, but it really emphasizes that functions are first class objects in Python. And so you can do all kinds of cool things, including passing a function to a function. Now, why would you want to do that, Brian? Why would I want to pass a function to a function? Well, what it lets us do is add more functionality, if you will, to a function by having the decorator function, the one that is having it as a parameter, do additional things that the original function didn't do. It's extremely useful when you want to add some sort of common functionality or behavior to a bunch of code and you don't want to have to go back and edit each function to add all this additional features for example suppose you did all this great coding or maybe you came into an application that's already written and it's got thousands of functions already done only there's no logging and all of those functions should be logging that they ran a function that they opened the tables that they wrote things they deleted things none of that's done you want to add it quickly. You don't want to have to go into 5,000 different existing functions, run the risk of breaking any one or all of them by custom coding in each one, and all that work just so that you can log that function A ran, function B ran, what parameters it had, when did it run, what did it do, all these things. So instead, you could write a function that will do that for you. It takes a given function in, and it adds additional functionality to it, like logging. Or in the case I'm going to show you today is one that adds try accept logic to trap errors around functions. So instead of going into 5,000 functions, you write one, and then you just add it over literally a line just above your existing function, which decorates it. And I'll show you that because we're going to do that today. So if you didn't see my other video, there's a link in the description. Follow that, and you can watch it. Then come back to this because this is kind of following on from there. All right, so as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about adding custom parameters to a decorator. These are parameters which are just used by the decoration itself. Now, this is separate from the function which is decorated, which can have its own parameters. And that's why it's kind of complicated a little bit to do this, because you've got your function you're decorating, and that can have any number of parameters. But then you want to have control over the overall decorator, which also can have parameters and that's what I want to show you. Why would I want to do that, Brian? Why would I want to pass parameters to my decorator? Well, one reason is because you want to change the behavior of your decorator given different scenarios. Maybe you want to be able to pass a setting in there that says this is in, you know, development mode. This is for production. This is for, you know, any kind of situations I have. This is for just this is for debugging or whatever. So the idea is you want to change behavior. Maybe you, you've decided that you want to so for example, if you were doing the logging decorator I mentioned earlier, maybe you want to be able to pass a parameter to that that says, write the log to a SQL server table, and here's the information on how to do that, like where it is, write the data to a file, or maybe just display it, or any number of other types of settings. There's no easy way to do that unless you can pass parameters to the decorator itself. The other thing you may want to do is just pass extra information in that can be displayed. Maybe you're doing a lot of stuff and it's getting logged and you'd like to put a message in there that says, this is just Brian testing, ignore it, it's not important. In other cases, you may want to say, you know, this is critical production problem here, or maybe this is sensitive information or anything like that. You want to have that sort of extra ability and control. Now, before I get into my demo example, I want to add something here that I think is really useful in many scenarios, but in particular, when we're doing decorators, which is using something called an enum. Really easy to use an enum. You just say import, right? From the enum library, import enum. And an enum is something very intuitive to anybody who's worked with 
relational databases because you typically have what we call code tables, right? For instance, you might have payment types. It could be MasterCard, Visa, Discover, or whatever. And each one would have a code like ABC or maybe 123, and then a description like MasterCard or Visa. This is common in a lot of scenarios, so much so that I think most programming languages support the idea of enums. Python is no exception. So what we do for enums is we bring in the enum and we're going to then create a class. I'm going to call my class t-shirt size and I'm going to have small, medium, large, and extra large. And you can see it's a little like a dictionary also if you want to kind of equate it to that. I'm going to use a name small and the value of one. Medium is going to have a value of two. Large is value of three. And really behind the scenes, it's really the numbers that drive it. These labels are descriptive to make it understandable of what you're doing. And you can think of the whole thing as a, as a group of different coded values so that I want to know what the t-shirt sizes are and I can see them right here. The nice thing about using enums is really easy to understand what you're doing. It encapsulates the values in a way that says, oh, I get it. All of these are just part of different t-shirt sizes. So that's the idea behind them. So it's great for readability and that's a good reason alone to do it. So here we're creating a class t-shirt size it's an enum and we're going to set it up with small medium and large now bear in mind these are not strings these are actually like labels or attributes for these numbers and then i'm going to assign the t-shirt size medium i'll put it to x and then i'll just display x here and we can see that x shows up t-shirt size dot medium and the value two so again really easy to make sense of what it's doing now what if i just assign a variable t-shirt size so if i do y period, and then press tab, I'll automatically get a list of the valid values for my type. Again, easier to understand and less error prone than if I just said use a list of various strings or constant. So what's your use case, Brian? What are you going to do today? All right, what I'm going to do is create a function decorator that will add try accept functionality to a given function. And I may slip because I always think try catch other languages like Visual Basic and C Sharp. I think it's try catch block. Python calls it try except, but it's the same idea. Now, what that means is when you have code execute, it could break, right? You could divide by zero or do something that's not okay. And when bugs happen, the try blocks are meant to catch it, and then you can handle the error that occurs. That's the idea behind it. I actually had this happen to me. A lot of code was written. And there was no error handling anywhere. So I decided a good way to support sort of a default at least level of error handling was to do a decorator. I could do a decorator that encapsulated the try accept functionality. However, I wanted to have some custom control over it. And I'll explain that. This is literally what I did. So I wanted to include some custom parameters to my decorator. What is a message? I might want to say this is just, you know, development or it's just unit testing or something. It might even be my name. Like, hey, Brian's doing this. Don't worry about it. The other part is I wanted a verbosity level, and verbosity level is something I got the idea from PowerShell. PowerShell has a built-in attribute, which is verbose, and when you put it, you can say verbose, and there's various settings that will give you a lot of messages, like debug is one of them, or less messages. And I like that idea because then you can kind of change it easily. So I wanted to have a flag like that in my decorator that I could control. So let's look at my demo here. We're going to create an enum, only instead of t-shirt sizes, I'm going to call it verbosity. It's of a class enum that we're pulling in. So we're going to be creating a class that is inheriting enum. And then we're going to have the two, three values here, debug, info, and minimal. The idea is that debug is going to be the most messages that will be displayed. Info is going to be medium level, and minimal is like, only give me it if I have to see this, that kind of thing, very minimal messaging. Typically. In development, you might be in debug mode, and in production, you'd probably be in like minimal message mode, right? You don't want to see a lot of messages printing out. And here's my sort of overall code here. Now, what's different in this versus the prior example is I have three levels to get what I want. My outermost try catch decorator here is the one that's going to take in my custom parameters. My try catch at this level is actually the part that's going to do what I'd been doing before, just doing my decorator for my function. And then this part here, this wrapper, is the part that's going to be called every time I execute the decorated function. Kind of walk through this a bit. What do I have in here again? Message, 
and you can put type hints, which is a good idea when you're doing functions. So colon str just not going to be enforced. Python doesn't care what you do. It just lets you do anything. But somebody reading this realizes like this should be a string and it could be like int for an int or something. And I'm setting a default, meaning if somebody doesn't pass in a message one, it'll just default to this value. Not a very great value, but it's there. Message level is of type verbosity, that enum we created. And I'm going to set it to a default of verbosity debug so give it the most messages possible which is great for development mode building my try catch outer block here right but now i've got my wrapped function this is what's going to do the grunt work this is the actual decorator functionality itself and here notice it takes in the args and kwags now the try catch this decorator will get the function but the function arguments and keyword arguments are coming in here args is arguments and Asterisk actually is KW args is keyword argument. So we'll capture everything. And then I'm going to print when it runs the function, it's going to print right at the top message level. What message level is it at? If the message level, and by the way, in Python, you have to say equal, equal when you're comparing values, not equal. Equal is assignment, but equal equals comparison. So message level equal, equal debug or message level equal, equal info. It will print this message before the function. And then it's going to print the function name is called. This little exclamation R is just going to put quotes around this when it expands the value. This will actually show you the function name. Here it says, okay, if message level equal equal verbosity debug, so it won't happen in other cases. Here it's going to work for two levels, right? Debug and info. It will not print if it's minimal. And here it's going to say only if it's debug, then it's going to print out the arguments and the keyword arguments. That's what's happening there. All that, but we really haven't gotten to what this decorator is trying to do. It's doing the try. So we're going to say try. It's going to call the function with the arguments and keyword arguments. Any return value will go into value. If it fails, it's going to jump right here. It's going to jump past this line because an exception occurred. It's going to go to accept. And accept has a special object called exception. And by saying exception as underscore exe, it's actually going to put the exception object into this object called underscore exe or that variable then here we're going to say print function and then it's printing the function name execution failed print the error details and here it's going to print out the exception object and it's going to return false now depending on what the function returns it could return anything but here if it fails it's just going to return false and then here you can see it's returning value so if it fails it returns false if it doesn't, it's going to return whatever came back for the function here. Wow, that's a lot going on. Let's take a look at it and see how it works. Uh, really simple here. I'm creating a function, divide numbers, right? And I'm passing in x and y, and I'm just going to return x divided by y. No problem. Here is where I add my decorator, at try catch decorator. And I'm not passing everything in for the parameters. I'm overriding message one, but I'm not trying to override the message level. So let's go up here. I'm calling this, and I can pass in message one or let it default. And here's message level, and I'm letting that default, as you can see here. So let's run this, and let's try running it with three divided by five. We run it, and notice we get all these messages because everything's so above. It didn't give us an error. It said 0 0.6, so it gave us that information. I'm going to go back up here a little bit so we see the message level printed. Since it's in debug mode, it also printed this message. It printed these messages. There were no errors, so it returned the value here, got the value, printed, you know, function execution succeeded, and then it should have returned a value. And here we are. Yep, did just what we thought. So that's great. What if we got an error? I mean, that kind of is the point of what we're trying to do here. Here I'm passing in 3, comma 0, which should get the divide by 0 error. So I'm getting the highest verbosity possible because it's in debug mode, as we can see. It did not print the execution succeeded. There was an error, the function name, the error, it failed, and the error details division by zero. So that's from the exception object. Python figured out that was the problem, and we return false when we get a, a failure, right? Let's do the same thing. So this really riveting function here I already created. I'm going to create it again, but I'm going to do a try catch decorator this time. Robosity is minimal. I don't want to see a lot of stuff here, right? It works. I know it does. Trust me. So I'll do it again. Now, because verbosity is minimal, 
I can see it displays that at all times, so it tells me it's minimal. It didn't give me all those other messages. It just gave me the bare bones, the error function and the error message and the exception object. I'm going to give you another quick example of doing parameterized decorators. So here it's going to be called check type underscore decorator. And I'm going to be passing three things, a data type, and a message one, message two. Again, message one, message two is just any kind of strings I want to pass in. But data type is kind of interesting. What I want to do is enforce a data type. So all of the data types will need to be of the same type that I tell it to validate to, or it will give me the message error invalid input. So that's what the outer decorator is doing. The inner decorator here is taking in the function itself. And when it gets decorated, it's going to print message one. So whatever you pass in here will get printed. Then we've got our actual decorator itself. This is when we call the function that's decorated, it will do this. It's going to print message two. But here's the real important part. So let me kind of walk through this. I'm saying for all the arguments and args, that's going to return to data type. And it's going to say they all have to be the same, basically. Whatever I told it here, it has to be that. If it is, then it's just going to return by calling my function with its arguments and keyword arguments, and we're all good to go. But if this does not succeed, something is not the right type, it's going to return the message error, invalid input. Let's take a look at this now in action. So a really simple example, I've got this string join, taking arguments in, we're not bothering with keyword arguments. We've got a string started here, st equal, just empty string. And then it's going to iterate over arguments. So whatever I pass in, they have to be strings, right? Because I want to chain them together. I'm just going to do a increment to it. So I'm going to just join them together and return the final string value. As far as this goes, I'm going to pass my first message, which should it show as soon as I apply the decorator. And the second message, which won't show until I run the function with the decorator. So let's run this. And sure enough, we can see that this printed because we did that as part of the decoration assignment. And now we're going to say string join one and two, and it worked. How about string join two and five? These are ints. I don't think that should work. And just as we hoped, it says error, invalid input, because it looked over these arguments and it said, that's uh, that's not a string as far as I know. So it failed it. Great. Let's try it a little more flexibly. I'm going to use a different function now, because the idea of a decorator is you can use it in a lot of scenarios, ideally. So in this case, I'm going to do something similar, but not exactly the same. I'm going to create a list, and then whatever you pass in, I'm going to loop over the arguments and append those to my list and then return the list. Now, I want to make sure in this case, not sure why, but let's assume it's a list of like people's ages or something. So I want to make sure that all of the types coming in are the same type, in this case, integers. Just like before, I've given it a type, but not strings now, ints. This is a little different too. I'm not just joining strings. I'm adding them to a list. But notice I can use the same decorator. If I do that, and now if I say list add one, two, three, it worked, right? There it is. If I say list add and I give it two strings, it fails because I told it I need ints and it didn't get ints. So it worked perfectly. So wrapping up our topic, we talked about why we want to add parameters and the fact that when we talk about adding custom parameters to a decorator, we're talking about the outermost decorator, right? The actual decorator, not the function being decorated. And the reason for doing that is that we can change the behavior of the decorator based on what we pass into it, or we can just add some things we want to include maybe to display or log somewhere that otherwise we wouldn't have. And you can think of your own scenarios of what you want to do when using decorators. Decorators are ubiquitous throughout the Python ecosystem. If you use something like Airflow, which is a very popular framework for automation, or something like Django for web app development or any number of things, they use decorators frequently as a way to sort of tie your code into the framework. Because using a decorator, if you think about it, you can pass a function to a function, so Django can tie your function into the larger framework. So that's all I have for this time. So please like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.